Hi, my name's John Andrews and I am the conductor of Rossini's Elisabetta, or uh, as we're calling him, Elizabeth I. It's an early work by Rossini. He was a great prodigy, one of the most talented composers of the 19th century. He was born right at the end of the 18th century in a small town called Pesaro and very quickly made his way into the centres of Italian opera. Now, he wrote his first opera at 18 and that very, very quickly cemented his reputation as one of the great young, fiery and witty composers of the early 19th century. He very soon came to the attention of the great operatic centres and in 1815-1816 he went to Naples. Naples at that point was one of the most important opera houses in Italy, probably all of Europe. It had a fantastic group of singers in the ensemble there and it also had a fantastic orchestra. And Elisabetta, Elizabeth I, was the piece that he wrote to impress the new theatre. It was a way of showing all of the things he could do and he got every trick out of his bag. He even rifled back into pieces he'd written over the past few years, took out the best bits and incorporated them into this opera. So in a way, it was his audition piece. It was a way of showing exactly what a young composer could do to make his mark on the operatic scene. It was a fantastic success and he built on that and continued that relationship with the theatre over the next five or six years, writing ever more elaborate, ever more demanding, ever more enormous shows, and at the same time, sending productions out to houses all over Italy. One of the amazing things about Rossini, and it's hard for us to imagine now, is that despite spending his entire life as a professional musician, as a composer, he was able to retire at the age of 38, the equivalent of a multimillionaire. So all of these operas that he wrote come from a very, very short time in his life. Elisabetta comes from his very, very early 20s. So it really is an energetic piece by a young man setting out to make his mark on the world. And he really, really does do that. It has four incredibly demanding roles. The Queen, Matilda, daughter of Mary, Queen of Scots, and then the Dukes of Norfolk and Leicester. And they're pitted against each other in this trial of strength. At the same time, he also took advantage of having this incredible orchestra at his disposal to really explore the sonic possibilities that you could get out of an early 19th century orchestra. In particular, there's a wonderful moment in Act Two where Lester is in prison and he's remembering happier times. And so Rossini, in the orchestra rather than on the stage, uses a pair of piccolos and a pair of corps anglais to conjure up this image of pastoral idyll. As if his mind's drifting back to a happier place. Now, these are instruments that had barely been heard in the Opera House at that time. We're talking about the same era as Beethoven's symphonies. Haydn had only just died. Mozart was fairly recently dead. So, he was being incredibly innovative in the sound world and the colours that he was using to really try and bring every ounce of drama into the theatre. In terms of his influences, Rossini was a huge admirer of both Mozart and Haydn. He loved Mozart's dramatic sense, but also Haydn's wit, his clarity, and also his real gift for structuring large-scale movements. And then in the theatre, it's people who we don't really think about anymore. Cimarosa and Paisello, but both of those were people were still active at the time. Uh, Cimarosa was recently dead, and Paisello was still alive. So he comes into a tradition of comic opera that was just emerging from the traditions of Mozart and from Haydn. What he does is take hold of it and take it in a much more overtly dramatic direction, particularly in terms of these serious operas. The weight and scale of them really grows, and that's why his influence is most noticeable. We tend to remember Rossini now primarily as a comic composer, but that's really not a reflection of his life at the time and his importance to his contemporaries. And it was as a composer of serious and tragic works that he had his most profound influence at the time. He was a huge influence on Donizetti and in many ways was a more adventurous composer than Donizetti. He was a huge influence on Bellini, 
but these models of serious opera were still the touchstone for the composers a whole generation later. So when Verdi starts writing with his early tragedies and even to the middle period of works like La Traviata, he's working very much within the framework that Rossini set up. And it's a cruel irony that we know so well the works that were influenced by Rossini, but the very works that he wrote which spread his influence across Europe have tended to drop out of the repertoire. Now there's a very good reason why they've dropped out of the repertoire, which is that they're unbelievably difficult to sing. This is some of the most difficult vocal writing you will ever hear on an opera stage. The sheer vocal dexterity, the sheer Olympian stamina needed to sing these roles is something quite beyond what we ask of singers most of the time. These roles require the ability to negotiate incredibly fast coloratura and at the same time to penetrate across really quite a large orchestra. So the demands they make on every single person on stage are huge and it's a very specialist kind of singing. And it's a kind of singing that dropped out of fashion once the bigger romantic style came about with Verdi and Wagner and a heavier style of singing. The ability to combine this stamina with the speed and agility and ability to get around these very fast and dexterous passages fell away and so it makes it very difficult to cast these roles. Fortunately we have a fantastic cast of young and experienced singers who can absolutely nail these parts to the back of the theatre.